The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Michael McAuliffe, and with me in the studio, as always, my good friend and co-host, Perry Heitzu. How are you doing today, Very, Perry? very well. Happy holidays and thank happy you for having me. Happy holidays to you, too. Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Festivus for the rest of us. Happy Saturnalia or whatever I've forgotten that you, that you uh, have a persuasion to. <laughs> enjoy yourself in this holiday season so here we are uh in in this holiday season maybe the last free holiday season in america you never know uh with with a, a new administration coming in um you know i i kind of think back to um uh, what uh, Chris Christie said uh, in the primary season last year uh, uh, on his pot policy that, well, if you got him, smoke him, because on the day one when I'm in office, it's going to be illegal. And, you know, some of the people that Washington's putting into play uh, in, in the administration are, are scaring me that way. Um, but uh, hopefully it's it's the momentum is going to make it difficult for them to put that genie back in the bottle. We can only hope so. Once again, these are just all talk for now, even though Sessions has been nominated and mm -hmm. things like that. I haven't heard him release any direct statements in relation to what Christie had to say. You know, he's kept relatively quiet since his nomination, and smartly so. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we'll see how the process rolls through, and... Uh, We'll just take it well, from there. Well, because he actually has other uh, uh, other issues. Now, he, his benefit is being a senator. The other senators have to confirm him are usually polite. And oh, absolutely. Through. And but, that's the shame of it is they will absolutely yeah. confirm him as the camaraderie goes among mm -hmm, senators. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he was he was too race deemed by the Senate to be too racist to be confirmed as a federal district court judge 30 years ago. And so uh, we'll see whether uh, they feel that uh, he has changed at all in that time. Uh, well, it's a new day. It's a New day, yes, it is in America, uh, and America uh, includes not only uh, the United States, but of course our neighbor to the north, Canada, and uh, the president up there. We have a little different election, uh, a different momentum in the marijuana movement mm -hmm. because, of course, uh, the new. Uh, President uh, Trudeau has pledged that 2017 is the year that he is going to be legalizing cannabis throughout Canada. Canada. So that's um, well. Once again, I think that's long step. overdue. Um, I think if you're in Canada right now and you're in the cannabis industry, you got to be a little bit jealous of some of your southern neighbors mm -hmm. having. It seemed like Canada was so far ahead of the United States in this policy, and it seemed for, just for all these years like they were on the cusp of legalization, mm -hmm. having just dispensaries all over the all over the country. And I mean, I myself have had a wonderful time in Vancouver on numerous occasions in their semi-legal framework that they have going there. And that's all Amsterdam actually mm -hmm. has is a semi-legal framework. But regardless, it was a blast up there and everyone seemed to get along just fine. You know, the sky didn't fall in uh, in the neighborhood surrounding the cannabis cafes or anything like that. And all of a sudden, these, you know, Coloradans and Washingtonians and people like that have just blown right by them with the regulatory process. And I think these people up there got to be pulling their damn hair out waiting for Trudeau to get this done. So, And, and you know, it, it just a, as a quick aside, what you're saying uh, about values and stuff, I have um, uh, I, I read a story within the last week saying that um, studies now uh, around the country, and particularly Colorado, show that when dispensaries open up, it actually increases property values in the area. It I've heard that. Um, I've heard that before that study came out. My yeah. aunt is a resident in like right in the middle of down. I don't know why the hell she lives in the middle of downtown Denver, but she does like right in the thick of it, mm -hmm. and uh, she has seen her rent get jacked up significantly since cannabis legalization has taken effect and I've heard this from other people who live in these other uh, legalization municipalities such mm -hmm. as Portland and Seattle and mostly downtown metropolitan Denver I'm not so sure it has a major effect on the suburbs yet I haven't seen mm -hmm. that data but as for the big major cities it absolutely raises value because people move to town to fill the jobs and, uh, and it just these places increases have, property have value. high security around them, mm -hmm. so so it acts as a deterrent. You think that's as, uh, as opposed to a magnet? To I, I had never even considered that as a deterrent. That the that the uh, 
security that's uh, assigned to these dispensaries has an effect on the local sure. area just kind of watching the strip malls and things like that mm -hmm. that's very interesting mm -hmm. uh, the property value is a, is, a, is a big thing though and I've heard people online bitch about that on the uh, legalization like the yes on two uh, it, pages and things right. like that they're that like it's oh, making things more expensive and it's driving up rents in yeah, an area sure well, but hell I'm a property owner here so that's great for me you know I'm looking to well <laughs> Hopefully the Fed doesn't raise their interest rates too fast to mm -hmm. give some of these people who are entering the cannabis industry time to get en uh, established enough to where the banks will uh, give them a loan for a home before it gets too ridiculous so that some of these people who are entering the industry can actually benefit from their entering other than just getting screwed over by the increase in, uh, in rent, you know, and, and they have the ability to take that risk on behalf of themselves and their families. Without getting too deep in the water of the Federal Reserve System uh, that, you know, I know something of, but not... I'm not, not an expert. Um, it's interesting that throughout the election season and uh, the past several years, they have withheld interest rate hikes. They've held the line, held the line, held the line through the election. And, uh, and now, uh, post-election, when, when this new administration is going to come in that's, a, that's scary to many people, uh, all of a sudden the Fed is starting to raise rates. And not only did they you know, raise rates almost they immediately, rates? Yeah. but they announced that they're going to raise rates uh, up to three times next, next year, year, and then yes. maybe three to four times the following year. Yes. And uh, the market has just shrugged all that off and continues to climb. And that's what's laughable to me, is that if they would have done said that a year ago, mm -hmm. ho, ho, you know, there would have been a massive correction in the market. It, it's interesting how uh, 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 Chairman Greenspan, uh, Greenspan, pardon mm -hmm. me, uh, said uh, several years ago that uh, he saw that these bubbles were developing because of irrational exuberance. And I, I think in the market right now, you're seeing some irrational exuberance uh, at some of the people that Trump is putting into uh, positions of authority, people like uh, um, uh, uh, Wilbur Scott and uh, the Wilbur, Secretary me, of State Ross, um, uh, and uh, yes, and and some of these. So it, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But uh, I'm excited. Anyway, you back, <laughs> getting back to Canada, though, yeah. um, it, it's not only that the change is coming there, but it's still there's friction. You know, at the border now. Oh, there's major friction at the border. Canada, people think the Canadians are super friendly. They do not screw around with their border security. Right. Uh, if you give the wrong answer to their question, you better know what to say or but, they will not let you in. But it works exactly <laughs> uh, coming the other way as well. And this article that I have from Marijuana.com called The Trials and Tribulations of Trump and Trudeau by John Hiltz uh, says that uh, some Border Patrol officers on the American side have taken to asking random Canadians uh, if they have smoked marijuana in the past. Uh, if the person entering the U.S. answers yes, they are denied entry. That's insane. And this is something that Canada's public safety minister, uh, Ralph Goodell, called a ludicrous situation which needs to be addressed. And, and that, that so is pretty insane. soon, So pretty soon you could have potentially recreationally legal British Columbian citizens traveling into recreationally legal Washington right. and being denied that entry because they consume their recreational cannabis in their, in their home. Yes. That's that's insane. Uh, it, welcome, welcome to America, my friend. Uh, yes, it, it is certainly insane, uh, but it is uh, it is it is actually happening here, and so uh, we're going to see what happens now. With how some of these uh, disputes can get resolved with with the the greatest deal maker in the history of humanity. Yeah, we'll see if this deal. Uh, in the White House. We'll see if this becomes an issue that they d that they address directly. I'm sure Trudeau and, and Trump will talk eventually, regardless of how maybe yeah, their constituents sure. may not agree with each other face to face on the on the issues. You know, Trudeauians and and Trump Trump supporters. Oh, or whatever. they're they're completely different you know, on but, foreign relations, yeah. on socialized medicine, and and you know, marijuana and is on, just uh, another issue where, where they're going to have very different views. See what happens. I have high hopes for sure. You know, Trudeau uh, impressed me when he first came in. Mm -hmm. Physically fit dude, young, popular, etc. Yep. Pissed me off with what he said about Castro, but I'll let that slide for now. <laughs> we Castro's move on. Dead. Well, yeah. So it don't matter. But um, one, one of the things here that, that uh, struck me of interest in this article is it says that one of the biggest political dances that Prime Minister Trudeau will need to do is getting one of, getting out of three international treaties that outlaw the production of cannabis. The U.S., of course, is a big supporter of these treaties and could make things difficult if they want to. And yeah, we make things difficult for, for other governments around the world all the time. Now, it's interesting, though, that it says that these uh, treaties which uh, outlaw uh, cultivation of cannabis, because Canada is one of the largest 
suppliers, producers of bird seed in the world, uh, of which 90% is hemp seed. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, hemp is still cannabis. So if there are these UN treaties saying you can't grow it, then how do they have this big hemp market? I don't, I don't know. I just I find little things like that, and I, I, I dig them, and I'll get back to you with an answer mm -hmm. when, once I have them. But well, um, if our new fearless leader has his way, we might not have such a large influence on the UN in the coming years anyway. So that yeah, be yeah, I saw void. something just uh, this morning that said that that uh, the president elect said that the UN is is just a club for a bunch of rich people who want to hang out. There is some truth to be said about that. Uh, it is developing a very League of Nations esque. Mm -hmm. Um, status in the world, you know, it doesn't really wield any real authority. They have no right. standing army. Right. You know, they have a lot of suggestions, but no way to enforce those suggestions. Uh, because no one wants to give up their so, uh, sovereign status to some other larger body. Oh, of and course so, not. You know, why, it, why the hell would you? We right. see, you know, we were trying to we tried to be instrumental in the creation of the United Nations and its directives mm -hmm. and things like that. And even we have kind of lost lost control of what we wanted to do with it. So that's why I think the frustration comes. Yeah, I think the frustration there is because we had in mind what we wanted well, to yeah, do exactly. with it. We, do, we weren't taking into account the other 165 countries around the world who might also have something to say about it. Uh, at the it. time it was formed, they didn't really have much to say we were yeah. the only industrialized country left in the world and yeah. now there are yeah. serious issues in play so <laughs> and look at the world we have developed yeah. so you know so keeping on that Canadian theme though um, we see that uh, a day after opening uh, some cannabis culture stores selling recreational marijuana in Canada uh, were raided resulting in the arrest of owner Mark Emery and uh, you may have heard of Mark um, he's been around for oh, at least 20 years now uh, he's a self-proclaimed prince of pot and uh, for many years he ran a seed uh, providing business where uh, he would uh, deliver seeds to people uh, essentially around the world. Yeah, uh, he did wanted. not care where you were because he knew that where he was in Canada, what he was doing was legal. Absolutely, he was in compliance with the Canadian government and, and all statutes there, but by sending some of these seeds to the United States, where it's not legal, um, he actually uh, got the DEA so pissed off that um, that they leaned on Department of Justice, who then leaned on state, who leaned on the Canadian government, and the Canadian government actually surrendered one of its own sovereign citizens to uh, criminal adjudication in the United States uh, for uh, a crime in the United States that's completely legal in Canada. And he wound up uh, getting sentenced to five years in federal prison for uh, his role in, in owning this company. Uh, doing something completely legal in the country uh, of his origin and where having business, never actually stepped forward having, to do said business in the United States exactly and and yet um, Canada got uh, pressured into this and um, now he's out and some people they have an experience like that they go quietly away into the night not Mark he's one of these guys he's gonna keep fighting and so um, well, you know to be fair a day after opening, the cannabis culture store selling recreational cannabis was raided. Right. Is recreational day after opening. Is recreational cannabis legal in the municipality that he was no, not yet. trying to operate in? Okay. Not yet. He's pushing. He, he's pushing. <laughs> well, but, I mean, but bro, his, what his, are you doing, his point, man? His point, I, I think, is that if the Canadian government couldn't respect its own laws and constitution and protect its own citizen mm -hmm. from the incursion of a foreign government, then why should he respect that government and its laws uh, on this when clearly There's not only the people but the new that. government that, that has come into power no. has already said that they're uh, that they're going to legalize this that's understandable and i'd be angry at him too the reason why i unfollowed his page is because he got very uh, aggressively involved in our political process which he doesn't have any fucking business sticking his nose in as a canadian mm -hmm. and uh, i understand you know it was our pressure that brought him here, but it was his government who capitulated. Oh, wait, they wait. could have told us, you know, kick rocks, yeah. what are you going to do? They were the ones who backed off, so I think the finger should be pointed at his own people. He should be looking to them, which is really what this is all about. We interfered in Iraq's political structure a few years back. We didn't have any compunction about it. Um, you know, but, but as, as far as this goes, uh, you know, Mark Emery here is being an agent provocateur. He is absolutely pushing this, and he is trying, he is trying to get publicity because for him and his businesses 
there's no such thing as bad publicity. Um, he's willing to be um, uh, a martyr for the cause because he has. And a martyr he will be. And a martyr again. Uh, you know, one of the things I find interesting about this story is this, as Perry said, uh, this raid happened a day after this uh, facility opened. Uh, and this store in Mount Royal that had been raided uh, had sold out its stock, leaving only cash for the authorities to find. Wow. And so my question to you, Perry, as a, as a lifelong Republican and a good business type person, is what kind of business could you imagine that you opened the first day of your business and you're sold out by the end of the day? And, and isn't that what anyone in business, that would be their wet dream? Of course it is. Well, if you're the only store opening in the city that has the product that's in such high demand, of course you're going to sell out. I would assume that no other recreational cannabis stores had the balls to open on said day mm -hmm. and give him said competition. Well, if there were a dozen where he was in, in competition with and still said, I sold out 40 pounds of product, you would impress me. If I, okay, if I went on to Las Vegas Boulevard mm -hmm. right now with a kiosk and said, I have grams of wheat for sale for $10. I would sell 40 pounds in a day mm -hmm. in, a, in a heartbeat. Until and I would most, rolled yeah, up. And yeah, and I would all, I'll also be mm -hmm. arrested either that day mm -hmm. or the next day. Mm -hmm. So when people, you know, uh, I mean, of course, it's, uh, it's an uh, insanely in demand product. Mm -hmm. So it does not surprise me at all that he sold that. I think it's kind of funny that they only had cash. Yeah. You know, I mean, wish you would have hit it that would have been a better story that would have been smart you know that would have been funny funnier but you know here we are but but the idea being that you have a product that is in such huge demand and we're going to talk about this more a little later in the show with, with another country uh that is seeing this that people uh even though they know that the people who are buying this are also breaking the law mm -hmm. they don't care no because they don't see it as a as a viable and and a legitimate law. Well, this is what happens when business interferes with free market capitalism and the will of the people. Let's mm -hmm. talk about Nevada versus California versus Arizona. I mean, mm -hmm. we've gone over this numerous times, and I'll go over it one more time. Uh, it's not it's not legal to sell lottery tickets in the state of Nevada. The number one selling Powerball station in the entire country oh is just across the line is in Prim. Nevada slash California, right, right there. It's obvious that a large number of Nevadans, mm -hmm. so much so that it's the biggest sell, bigger than New York City or Philadelphia or Chicago or any sure. of these big municipalities that sell it. It's all about prim because we want it, and yet the powers that be don't want it because they feel it, it'll 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 interfere with other revenue streams mm -hmm. in the state that we've drawn from mm -hmm. uh, traditionally. Uh, Arizona, same thing. You look at the border between Laughlin and Bullhead City. There's a little river. There's 10 casinos, beautiful large casinos on one side and nothing on the other, but there's a lottery yeah. station there. I mean, we yeah. could go over this time and again, but when municipalities or local government <sighs> thinks too much, Mm -hmm. They miss out on very obvious revenue streams that really do no damage and only seek to hurt their own ego. Right. And right. I, I think that's where this, you know, that's really goes. And I, I, I think it's kind of uh, funny that he's choosing to, in his opinion, try to embarrass them mm -hmm. in this way to well, hell with his own safety. Yeah, but yes, he, he is he's trying to push the point and, and we'll see what happens. The last time he pushed it to this degree, uh, <laughs> he gave up five years in a United States federal prison. Uh, I don't think it's going to be quite that bad this time, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll keep you appraised of this. Uh, but I, I do think uh, he is one of the heroes of the movement as opposed to one of the goats. Uh, he is, uh, whether you agree with his, um, uh, his tactics or not, you know, like uh, the original Dr. Reefer, Pierre Werner, who was in here last week whether you agree with his tactics or not the overall message of what he was trying to do uh, I think is absolutely valid and the same thing with uh, with Mark Emery here so we'll uh, we'll keep you uh, apprised of this situation as it develops so as we come uh, as we come to the end of that story we're going to take a quick break and be right back attention medical marijuana patients do you know what your cannabis actually contains are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. 
Digipath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. And welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, we're looking at what's happening around the country here, and uh, something that I got from Syracuse Con that I that I touched on last week, but I wanted to uh, develop a little bit further, uh, is that uh, New York hospitals are going to allow medical marijuana patients to medicate on site. And the article opens up and says hospitals will be allowed to create policies allowing patients to use the drug or have caregivers administer it to them under a regulation proposed by the state health department. The regulation is expected to go into effect in February. And I think this is really a, a major point forward in the nuts and bolts about how to bring medical cannabis use into the mainstream of medical practice. It seems so common sense. The title of the article should be medical facility allows patients to take medicine. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, just because their pharmacy downstairs next to the ER may not distribute mm -hmm. medical cannabis mm -hmm. yet, yet, doesn't mean that they should not allow these patients to heal themselves in the way that they feel is applicable to their condition. If they're not being obnoxiously obvious toward other patients. In example, if you were sharing a room with someone, I wouldn't expect you to be able to light up a blunt no. next to them. You know? But you might be able to eat a brownie. No problem, and, absolutely. And, or even uh, and our, our friend Dr. Dave Udy, who is a, a veteran and goes out to the uh, Veterans Administration Hospital here in Las Vegas, says that when he's out there, um, his caregiver will bring him edibles and he will consume right on the on the property. And the, the doctors don't have uh, a problem with this. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it's, the, it's the administration and the government that do. But when you're just eating a cookie, no one's going to challenge you. Well, who's responsible? for this decision in the state of Nevada if we wanted to go forward and allow give the hospitals the individual ability to make this decision on behalf of their patients who would we go forward to who would we lobby? well the the group that, that would ultimately make this decision would be the uh, the health division uh, uh, and oh, the, the medical marijuana course. program however uh, given what I've seen from them over the past half dozen years or so they are not going to make a single move without authorization from the legislature so ideally as we have new legislation uh, going to be considered in this next session, uh, we can insert a line item or two in the, um, uh, the, bill, draft in the bill draft itself, uh, essentially giving hospitals the ability to craft their own policies and essentially holding them harmless just the same way when you get a, uh, a medical marijuana uh, license application from the state, one of the documents you have to send back to them is a, a, a liability waiver saying right. that, that you will not hold the state of Nevada responsible for any stupid shit you do while you're medicated. Uh, essentially, and that, that's the plain talk, not the not the legal. a similar waiver for the division of health and hope that they take the bait. Exactly that, and and so um, as long as the hospital is not going to be uh, held uh, liable for allowing patients to do this, uh, the state should, as you say, allow medical facilities to uh, allow their patients to take medicine. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> 
wow, what a what a concept. Novel concept, really? no doubt. Yeah. Uh, and I hate to say, oh, you know, well, if one state can do it, we can. But now that the precedent has been set, mm -hmm. I would think that it would be a little bit easier to maybe, if we were having trouble, we could reach out to one of these people from New York and say, hey, how did you do it? How Absolutely. did this regulation come and, and, down? And would you be willing to help us with this? And you certainly see that that happens all the time, especially in this area, when uh, Tick Sigerblom freely admits, oh, we model a lot of the law after Oregon and after uh, Arizona and well, after so Cal what? Co uh, Colorado. Well, no, the idea being that we were taking the best pieces of these other laws from these other states, so mm -hmm. there's no reason we shouldn't be able to do it with something like sure. this as well. Um, sure. It absolutely makes sense to me. Uh, one thing uh, towards the end of the article that, that I saw was a paragraph that says licensees would also be able to produce and sell more than five brands of product the current limit in place which is seriously restricting supply as well as variety of product currently available to patients so in New York you don't have smokable cannabis uh, it's all oil it's all extracts that you can get but apparently under the current regime all you have are five brands five strains Hmm. And that's it. I mean, you can you can go into dispensaries here in Nevada or in California, Colorado, and have dozens and dozens of One, strains. I wonder how they came to that idea. Like, uh, who were the lucky five? Well, what are the lucky five strains that got picked? And is that per cultivator? Or is that's, that on that's, a state That's, that's not a per cultivator, but there are only half a dozen cultivators in, in New York. <laughs> okay, so there's a maximum of 30 strains in New York around. City, yeah. So yes, you know, and, and that's absolutely crazy. I saw 30 strains in a shop just the other day, one, one shop here, but I mean. <laughs> it, it just goes to show how difficult it is for these legislators to wrap their mind around this issue. It seems to be so alien and thorny to them that they, they come around with, with the most obtuse, insane, and, and just plain crazy ideas. Yeah, I just I wonder what stuff. the thought process was when someone's sitting in committee and going, you know what, let's limit it to five different strains and how that got yeah. you know through and approved and all that. I, I don't know. We'll yeah, yeah, crazy. That's like, that's like telling the Gallo brothers, "All right, we're fine. Here's your license to produce wine, but you can only grow five varieties." You know, it's just. It, it's just crazy. Hmm. Anyway, um, for on, on a little lighter note for a change, um, we'll, we'll come here. I, I went to GreenRushDaily.com uh, as I was searching out things for, for the show, and it came up with a, an article called The Hardest Weed Quiz You'll Ever Take. Uh, I don't know about that, but... Later. Okay, but we have a few questions for you, and, and we'll see if uh, if you can uh, play along out there and figure out uh, uh, the proper answer for these, and see how uh, how up you are in the stoner mystique. Uh, and and the first uh, uh, relates to a, a, a friend of the show who we interviewed a few weeks ago, Tommy Chong. And the first question is, when was the movie Up in Smoke released? And would that be in 1978? 1975, 1970, or 1982. Well, were you even on the planet back then? No, no. <laughs> so I guess you're not the, the best, best case. The best guy best case scenario, I would be uh, three years removed. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm gonna throw it out there and say 75, but I don't. I don't hey, even know. Hey, 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 old man. 78. 78. Yeah, yeah, 78? yeah. You, you oh, looked Christ. at the cheat sheet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, and indeed, it was 1978. I remember it was. Uh, it was after high school when, when this uh, crazy film came out and started a whole series of films by Cheech and Chong at that time. Was that really? the first big yeah, up in pop, smoke was pop culture marijuana movie were there other marijuana related movies that had a big influence before then or like the days to confuse well i mean you, know, you, had, like, you had reefer madness back in 1937 no no that's but, not the same no but uh, well i'm trying to say are you showing uh, are you saying that that uh, uh, the first film to show uh the cannabis culture in a in a positive light but the, even then i'm not okay I'm not so sure that we're cheech and chong we're cheech and chong the first Hollywood cannabis celebrities that obviously had that positive uh, connotation attached to their careers as being successful I think very, very likely because yeah. Len, Lenny Bruce in, in the 50s and the 60s uh, had drug use issues and arrests but he, he was never uh, that was not um, something he was standing up for um, you had George Carlin who had mentioned drug use but it was not really the center of his act I, I do think that Cheech and Chong were the first to to really make that the, the mainstay of their shtick yeah, and and they started out on records. Yes, vinyl. Yes, okay. yeah. I still. I here we are. Legalization <laughs> only a week away. 
I still have my original big bamboo rolling paper out of that album. Oh, no shit. Uh, yeah, that'll, that, that'll roll up a, a you know, awesome. quarter pound joint, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, okay, next question. Uh, who was it that said, if everyone smoked weed, the world would be a better place? Uh, I've heard you say that on numerous occasions. <laughs> really? Oh, I, I, I must have been a challenging, uh, channeling uh, one of my inner demons. Uh, would that be Snoop Dogg? Uh, I could imagine him saying that. Would that be Bob Marley? Uh, maybe Jennifer Aniston, who's quite a well-known pothead. Uh, or uh, Kristen Dunst, who is uh, <laughs> okay. uh, another quite well-known pothead. Um, uh, I'm not going to go with Snoop because he didn't say it in the way he would say it. Okay. Uh, probably Bob or J uh, you know that would be. Uh, uh, that, that would be tough, better, but I but I, I do recall spiritually enlightening. I think I, I do recall when when this hit uh, several years ago, and she received a little flack for it at the time, but nothing major, and it was Kristen Dunst. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right, next uh, the third question on our third out three out of ten. Uh, quiz here is which country is believed to be the largest producer of marijuana and it's interesting they say believed to mm -hmm. be because yeah. you don't really have good solid figures here just you know a lot of government propaganda would those be uh would that be the united states amsterdam mexico or paraguay what do you uh, think out there? Well, uh, today, right now, mm -hmm. shit, us. It's got to be. It's got to be. It's got to be the us of America, huh? Uh, I don't. I don't know about that. You're shaking your head over there, John. I think you thought it was Mexico, didn't you? I thought it was that Mexico, but it's Paraguay. But it How the is, hell is indeed that Paraguay. Not, I thought that's it was what your, I said. Uruguay's legal, How right? Is that not possible? Paraguay. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Every, absolutely. At, as small as the country is, everybody in the country must be growing it. Oh, it must it must, must be grow a great well climate there. there yeah, yeah no it must yeah. be a good climate for it there so paraguay if you want to make your next adventure plans for <laughs> south america make sure you hit uruguay and paraguay uh fourth question when was it that california legalized medical marijuana it's been it's been a oh, while that's 96 now. i know that one boy we don't even have to go to the choices here you know that's easy. i'm that's, supposed that's to put one. up 2006 76 96 or 86 for everybody to, to no, take a pick the, of but that was one. an easy one no doubt about it okay so here, here's the next question the hops in beer are the same family of flowering plants as marijuana true or false no, true sure you just look at them if you yep. just think, think a good i've always thought from the first time i saw a hops plant growing i was like god damn it looks so much like weed and the first thing that came to my mind was i wonder if you could flavor beer with cannabis in the same way that you could mm -hmm. with hops you know what i mean like like there's a tangy strain from evergreen organics i really like mm -hmm. you know and i thought they have a really like strong terpene profile and i'm like oh maybe you could put that and make like a citrus IPA with it or something like that, mm -hmm. but then it wouldn't be pale ale because it's not has hops. But I don't. It's just these weird ideas that go through my head, you know. And, I mean? and it's something that that you are going to see developed and commercially marketed in the next five to ten years. You know, well, okay, maybe a little longer yeah, now. We'll see. But but you will you will see that happen uh, as soon as it's add in the mainstream. Four years it's be to that. all over the place. What? Yeah, yeah. Add four years. Yeah, to that. Add, four, four. add four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly that. So another true or false here. Uh, we talk about color. Colorado a lot. So in Colorado, uh, there are more dispensaries than Starbucks. Is oh, that's that an old wives' tale. That can't be true. Um, you wouldn't. You would so, but there are a lot of people smoking pot in Colorado. There are indeed uh, more dispensaries in Colorado than Starbucks. That's and, incredible. You know, I think that's a terrific thing because but, those dispensaries are individually owned, private capital and equity groups, and they're all small ownership money. as opposed to large corporate ownership in, in wow. a Starbucks. I'm happy to see that the marijuana and industry and is doing And they're doing well some there. good. They're doing very. They're doing. You know, it makes good me feel like if we had a set like. If we had an unlimited number of dispensaries and let the free market dictate who opened and who closed, it's obvious that there are a large number of people who are doing it right and are able to stay open and keep the doors open and Absolutely. make money on these places. Absolutely. It gives me hope for the future. Well, that yep. just shows the demand. No doubt. No if, doubt. If, 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 you have, yeah. <clears throat> if you have that many dispensaries in that small an area that is supported and can stay in business, especially with... Mm -hmm. What they're paying in taxes and all well, that. Well, right. their the tourist cost revenues of are going yeah. up. They had their biggest year in 2015. Yeah. So, okay, next we have, what is, where did the first recorded use of marijuana take place? Was that in Amsterdam, Egypt, Mexico, China, 
or John's basement. <laughs> I don't wait, know. wait, wait! You said first recorded first use. First recorded. Oh, okay. Well, you've got all this recording. No, my first use around. wasn't I think recorded. You record everything yeah. that happens <laughs> over there. So anyway, uh, that that's uh, that's an interesting one. Amsterdam, of course, being a city, not being a country, right. takes itself right out of the running for that. Uh, and uh, there was certainly cannabis use uh, recorded in Egypt way, way back, Mexico as well. But uh, taking the cake here is China, uh, whose uh, cannabis use goes back thousands of years uh, that has been recorded and so uh, China would be the correct answer in that case mm -hmm. okay so man you were mentioning Bob Marley earlier what wasn't Bob Marley buried with would that be a Bible or would that be marijuana his guitar or a pipe what do you think I, I got this one wrong actually myself well the reason why I would go with a pipe is because I've never seen a picture of him smoking one. It's always a joint. Oh, okay. He's always pictured with a, a, a big spliff. And uh, I've heard that he was a fairly religious guy, so that doesn't surprise me either. I would have thought he was a Rastafarian, though. So, it, so I wouldn't have think... I thought I he, he thought was half white, though, been, and I uh, thought the white side of his family was all like Christian and stuff like that. I'm not exactly so, sure about so, that. So he's Christian on Christmas and uh, Rastafarian on... Um, Hanukkah. Uh, huh, yeah, why not? You know, on, on yeah. Halle Selassie Day? I, I, I don't know. But uh, in fact, uh, he was buried with a Bible. He certainly was buried with pot, uh, his guitar. Sure. And he was not buried with a pipe. Because yeah, you're right. He was he was a joint smoker for all those years. So okay, question number nine coming. Where did the first arrest for marijuana possession in the United States take place? And our choices here are New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, or Denver. Now, being a native of New York City, I was sure hoping that we, we were going to this have one a blew me away. honor oh, here. That's, it would have been New York or Chicago, the oldest of the two cities. Mm -hmm. I'll be mm -hmm. there for sure. Even even so, but that that arrest wouldn't have taken place until 1937 when uh, uh, marijuana was federally uh, Realized, uh, right. outlawed, mm -hmm. and and so uh, as it turns out, it was not New York and it was not the second city of Chicago. Uh, it was further west than that, and uh, the 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 city of Denver, uh, which is one of the epicenters of the legalization huh. movement, uh, is the city where the first possession arrest took place. And that. That's why they call it the Mile High City. The Mile High City. Is that why they... I was yeah. wondering why they called it that. I, I thought it had something to do with a Mile High Club or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so where, we wonder, is cannabis totally 100% legal? Might that be Belgium over in Europe? Might that be North Korea in Asia? Australia or Venezuela? What do you think? Where, where, where do you think would be a bastion of freedom uh, for, for pot smokers around the world, John? I, 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 Look, I've heard I this would before. actually have guessed Venezuela. Venezuela. That would have right. been my first guess. Mine too. First, yeah. but mm -hmm. like, I, I, I know that it's North Korea. It is North and Korea, I yes. I have heard rumors of this, but I didn't know it was actually true because all of the news that we get told about North Korea is very... Filtered. Filtered, yes. So uh, yeah. it's hard for me to believe that, but you know, the more I hear about it, the more it, it turns out that it, it but might it's, be some, some credence to that. Well, as we're going to find out in just a, just a couple of minutes, um, uh, North Korea does have quite a thriving marijuana industry. Um, so that's it. Ten, ten quick questions. Uh, the, the hardest weed quiz I ever took? No, I don't think so. I got seven out of ten. Not so great, <laughs> but not the hardest. By, by any it's means. a passing grade, Nevada. Yep. So we're gonna we're gonna come here uh, to to the story I just mentioned about North Korea and uh, Greenwash Daily also uh, has is totalitarian North Korea a cannabis paradise? Well, I, I don't think North Korea and paradise can go together in the same sentence in any construct. So, uh, uh, so I, I think we're going to have to say no to that. But um, according to a report from The Sun, which is based in London, uh, a pound of cannabis can be bought uh, in North Korea for the dirt cheap price of just $3. 
that's it. Three dollars a pound. Go smoke your heart out and have fun in North Korea. Boy, you are going to need it up there because you're, you're not going to have anything else to keep you warm. That's for sure. Um, I, I mean, and that seems like a dirt cheap price to us. I mean, we, we pay we pay more than that for a joint. Yeah. Uh, you know, let alone uh, anything larger than that. And and the thing is, though, farmers in North Korea are actually making a decent living off of the cannabis trade at that at this point. And hmm. you know, the idea that farmers can get rich off selling pot to Chinese or Russian foreigners may be pretty new, but um, cannabis has been a pretty normal feature in North Korea for centuries. It grows well there. It grows all over the place, just wild. Um, because North Koreans view cannabis as totally ordinary, they do not classify it as an illicit narcotic uh, like the U.S. and much of the rest of the world. Uh, and since North Koreans live in utter isolation from the rest of the world, they don't really know we've made it all illegal. So they think that, that the weed grown by the side of the road and however they use it is working for them. And these farmers now have realized that, um, that although they started growing it uh, in the 1980s because they had a they had one of many shortages and embargoes uh, and the uh, the dictator at the time uh, said that they should grow cannabis and use the oil from the hemp seeds to power their stoves and as a cooking oil and so they did and so they they've been using it for that for, for 40 years they've been using it as livestock feed and now they're realizing though that there's money to be made selling it to these tourists who come over the border yeah. from from Russia and from from uh, from China and you were you're saying how much can you carry in an airline bag I don't think you'd want to be trying to bring that that bag full of North Korean weed back into the no, United definitely States definitely not so, I you know I I, I get the feeling that it's probably not the best quality. I think it'd be an interesting ski trip. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, yeah, th that's true. It could be. Well, what's interesting, though, is is in this uh, this paragraph that I read, and then um, you know, the, there there's another one here saying that um, uh, that it's just totally normal, according to, to stories from people who've defected from North Korea. Uh, the plant is so prevalent that most people think it's totally normal. Cannabis grows outdoors in an ideal climate; can be found pretty much everywhere. <laughs> now, what gets to me though is these people coming across from North Car North Korea, North Carolina. Yeah, well, they're they're going backwards in their own way. But uh, North these people coming across from North Korea say, you know, they feel that it's the cannabis plant and usage is so totally normal and they say this a couple of different points in the story and we kind of lose track of that in this whole discussion in this whole debate that we have for for decades now that it's just a friggin plant it it is normal it will you give it sunlight you give it water you give it some dirt it will grow and you know they have made it a, a complete part of their economy and it seems to be working for them it's very interesting. Um, I'd love to kind of follow up on this in a few months and see if there's any, like, see if there's any more news we can get out of, out so, of North so we'll, Korea. So we'll get you a remote Canada. mic and you can do some on-site reporting for us. If you're paying, <laughs> fucking shit, <yeah. laughs> as, long, as long as I don't take a Bible, I think I'll be okay. <laughs> I'm agnostic, so I think they'll accept me over there. There you go. <laughs> well, talking about taking things, we're going to have to take a break real quick, and we'll be right back. My name is Janine Evans and I am the office manager at Getting Legal and we help people get their medical marijuana cards. Anyone can be approved for a medical marijuana card as long as they have a pre-existing medical condition. The medical conditions recognized in Nevada include severe pain, severe nausea, muscle spasms, seizures, glaucoma, cancer, HIV or AIDS, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Our staff helps every patient determine before they come in for a visit whether or not they will qualify. We take care of the whole process of getting a medical marijuana card from the state of Nevada from start to finish. Our services include paperwork processing, a physician's visit, notary services. All of our patients pick up their approval letters right here in our office. We make it fast, simple, and easy. During your consultation, we will discuss different products available at the dispensaries, such as edibles, lotions, and concentrates. We will also discuss different ways to medicate, such as smoking or vaporizing. You will receive a separate identification card identifying you as a medical marijuana patient, 
This is used to enter the dispensaries and only to enter the dispensaries. Every veteran receives a discount off of the full price of their card. We also offer discounts to anyone working within the medical marijuana industry. All you need to do is call 702-979-9999 and a member of our friendly staff will help you schedule an appointment. My name is Armin Imanijin. I work with Essence Cannabis Dispensaries. We have three dispensaries and they're all located in Las Vegas. We have the only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, which is located at 2307 Las Vegas Boulevard South on the corner of Sahara and Las Vegas Boulevard. I've been with Essence since Q1 of 2014. I'm the founder and one of the owners of the company. I've been involved in the marijuana industry just over two years and my background is actually in gaming. Uh, I was Vice President of Casino Marketing and Vice President of Casino Operations at the Tropicana Hotel and Casino for six years on the Las Vegas Strip. The Strip Dispensary is open from 10 a.m. to midnight seven days a week. There's ample amount of parking just behind the dispensary. The way I classify Essence is not to be defined by a certain special or a certain promotion. We have specials on 4th of July, 710, 420, Labor Day, and they're very strong and very aggressive specials. We're really excited to put them out for patients, but that's not what defines us and that's not what we want patients to come in for. We want patients to come in because we have the widest selection of the highest quality cannabis on the market at the fairest price with an unmatched experience. It's really important to us that we create an emotional connection with the patient and that's what keeps them coming back. And welcome back to the show. You know, uh, in the last segment as we were talking about North Korea, one thing that, uh, that I just occurred to me through the commercial, is that they're they're selling all this pot to Russians and the Chinese because that is most of the people who come in to yeah. North Korea, right? Now, if you've if you've read anything uh, about this in the last two three decades, you know that China go has these big sports stadiums and they will parade dozens of drug dealers or drug users out into the central area and they will shoot them in the head and they will have mass executions, public executions of these people. And despite the fact that this oppressive communist regime in China is massacring its own people over pot, you still have people crossing the border into North Korea and buying pot and bring it back into China. And if the, you know, Fucking it's balls bad enough them. in this country that we put people in jail for years, for decades, over nonviolent drug crimes. In China, they just give them a bullet to the head and they charge the family for the bullet. Is, and that, uh, is that why we have a higher prison rate than them, because they just kill everyone? <laughs> they, I'll, I'll tell you what, we, we have a higher prison rate than them. Um, it's for profit. Just barely, though, yeah. dis despite the fact that they kill a lot of people. We're, we're right up there in the top three per capita, us, Iran, and China. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think uh, your point there, the, that if they weren't executing all these people, they'd have even a, a higher prison rate. But once again, we, we may be talking about hundreds of people or even over the course of some years, thousands of people. But in, in a country that's got a billion people, that's still... You know, not, yeah. even, not even a drop in the bucket right. as far as changing their prison population. Um, but here in, here in the United States, uh, of course, people are, are facing less draconian uh, sentences than death, but, but a long prison sentence can be a death in itself. And there are a number of people who are in jail right now for cannabis crimes. And uh, one of the good things about the Obama administration over the past couple of years is he has been giving uh, pardons and commutations to uh, people who are serving long sentences in prison uh, for nonviolent crimes, uh, drug crimes in particular. And I think this is a, a step in the right direction. Um, I, I caught an article out of CannabisNow.com about uh, Luke Scarmazzo and his high school football buddy, Ricardo Montez, and they were running a prominent medical marijuana dispensary in Modesto, California. Uh, 
uh, back in 2006. And, and you may have heard about these guys previously because they, they were in the news. I mean, it's not like their dispensary got raided, and so that was national news in itself. Um, because there were a lot of places getting raided at the time, right. uh, you know, and of course, uh, with George W. Bush being the president of the United States, his Justice Department had no compunction against raiding uh, grows big, small, or, or anything in between, and they would they would raid grows as small as six plants. And so the idea that people running a dispensary uh, got arrested is no big deal on itself. But uh, just a few weeks before this, uh, these guys who were making nine million dollars a year in this facility. Um, uh, produced a music video, and uh, you know it was it was out there really gangster rap and all this, and I, I did see it one time, and you know in, in the video they prominently and and eloquently say several times fuck the feds, and um, the feds didn't like that. <laughs> Not at all. Careful what you wish for. Careful what you wish for there. Yeah, don't beard the dragon. So uh, just a few weeks later, the feds went in and raided them. Uh, of and, course. you know, uh, at, the, at the time, uh, you know, he was making this video to show him taunting the local Modesto politicians, bragging about selling and smoking copious amounts of weed. And, you know, and that's fine on a local level. But when he says, fuck the feds, mmm. That that's just seen as daring them to do something, and and that's what they did. I I really don't know what to tell you, kid. You know. No. Uh, <laughs> no. No. They they went in. They they were charged in federal court, uh, where of course state medical marijuana laws do not act as a defense. And he they had six other people working with them who pled guilty to lesser crimes and served sentences ranging from three years to probation. Uh, they turned down an offer to serve ten year prison sentences, and they went to trial instead. Now I gotta say, if it were me, I'd think a ten year sentence. Mm, I probably wouldn't want to say yes to that, and I, I'd, yeah, go, I'd go to trial, for trial and find, too, for sure. find people, you know, get them to find me uh, not guilty. But um, they were gambling with the fact that if they lost, they would get a 20-year prison sentence, and indeed, that's what happened. The feds were able to preclude the mar medical marijuana defense, uh, and they got convicted, and they got shipped off to jail. Unbelievable. So, um, you know, following a, another recent uh, uh, pardoning of 231 people, um, um, uh, these uh, these guys have now contacted uh, the White House, and they're asking for a pardon. And they feel that they 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 fit the uh, the requirements by being you know, nonviolent uh, drug crime. Uh, uh, they were not hurting other people, but uh, many legal experts are saying that uh, their crimes may not fit the model that President Obama has been pardoning for um, and because they openly and willingly ran a business and were more than cavalier about the possible risks, including the fact that it was illegal federally. And so they say that they were flouting these laws deliberately and so they don't deserve a pardon. From my mind, absolutely they do. I, I, I think that the president should issue um, as many as he can. Oh my! Issue a blanket pardon for for first-time nonviolent marijuana offenders. Get them out of the prison. Absolutely. And you know, you would think that the Republican Party, the 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 small government guys, should be on board with this as well because oh, you're, no, lessening, you see, that's, you're uh, lessening the amount. Uh, of, you see, they take the tough on crime approach. You see, you're being soft on crime by letting these hardened criminals out of jail early for the crimes that they willingly committed and, you know, they agreed to those sentences and blah, 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 and you're just, you know, subverting the justice system and using your executive power, but that's all bullshit to me. I think they should, uh, he should use that pen as many times as he can to let people out of jail until he he can't do it no more until his hands sore yes but what i would say those those other side to the other side about the crime is i don't consider this to be a crime many people in this country don't consider it to be a crime well Over if you don't like the way the law is uh, written you can country, work with your legislative representatives change true. laws you see fit for yourself in your community Over and 60 uh, percent of the country thinks it should be legal and yeah. so right now it is not a question of, of the people not letting their legislators know people say in poll after poll we voted this year eight out of nine oh yeah they states. just ignore us. You know, they, they oh, yeah. ignore it, and that, that's the problem. Oh, no doubt. You know, but hopefully uh, President Obama will use the remaining days of his, of his administration and will, well, indeed, as you say, get his pen out and sign as many the, of them These as people, I, I don't know how many times you have to see the writing on the wall 
I've seen what happens when the proud stand up to the federal government. There's no parades. It's not pretty. No, there's no parades or rallies for you. You just get locked up and away you go. And I saw what happened to, to yep. Reverend Eddie Lepp yep. who got out yep. of jail. There's a big GoFundMe for him right now. And they haven't raised any money for him because that's how people get treated in the cannabis industry. They wash you away and you get swept down the line yep. and you get forgotten about. And everyone yep. says, oh, good for you for standing up and here's your pat on the back and that's about all for you. Uh, I, I can say from personal experience, that's very true. So uh, we're, we're getting about ready to go, and uh, this is our last show of 2016. Yeah, it's, been and a, it's been a good year. It, it's been uh, interesting. Well, year. It, it was a good year for the first 10 months, and, and it was even a good year for, for the beginning of election night, too, uh, from, from my perspective. But, um, you know, as we, as we leave 2016, uh, this year is, I, I think, going to go down as one of the most consequential and momentous years in the history of cannabis reform. Absolutely. Uh, we had such uh, such a huge uh, step forward in the four states that legalized this year. And 2017, uh, we can look at it taking a, a step backwards with this new administration coming in and some of the hardline people uh, that they're uh, appointing. But Or um, we can take it as an opportunity to educate. Absolutely. And, and that's it. And, you know, as of January 1st, uh, before our next show, it is going to be legal for you guys out there wow. to, to, uh, to possess, to consume, to cultivate your own. And I would suggest strongly that everybody get out there and on January 1st, as soon as you can, go in there and, you know, put six seeds in six plants pots. Uh, go that out there and get some right. cuttings or, or get some clones from a friend. That is your legal right. Absolutely. Before the state has the, the chance to, to shut you down, uh, we want to have so many people cultivating in the state of Nevada that the state says, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in 25 miles in a, in, in a dispensary That's or right. not. You should be equally protected under the law. Everybody should have the right to grow. And the mm, best we'll way be to right. ensure that is to get out there and do it. And not only you, but give a plant to your mom. Give a plant to your girlfriend. Give a plant to your boss. Well, maybe not your boss. Uh, maybe not your you know, boss yet. Maybe not, not your boss just yet. But give a... Where can I get a plant? Where can you get a plant? Well, we'll, we'll talk to you more about that next time because I'm not going to be part yeah. of a federal conspiracy on air. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. But, but uh, the thing is, there are plenty of places that you will be able to get them and, and have friends. But but get out there and, uh, and, and let everybody know it's just a plant. Also, last thing, we have a New Year's weed party coming up at 827 South Las Vegas Boulevard. Yes. That's near Chicago Joe's, if you're familiar where that is. It's on uh, Las Vegas Boulevard near Charleston. And we will be celebrating the passage of question two on, on uh, January On New 1st, Year's Eve December and December 31st. Everybody is going to legally toke up together in a, in a mass uh, uh, display of uh, our, the power of our vote. Yeah, and it's from 7, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. And uh, if you have any questions about it, please contact us, 702, wecan702.org, or go to our Facebook page, We Can. You know where Once to find again, us. that's 827 South Las Vegas Boulevard, and it's going to be 7 till 1 a.m. All right, well, thank you guys for everything, and uh, happy holidays to all of you, and a happy new year. And this is for the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is Perry Haichu signing off for the year. All the best. <laughs>